I'm pretty sure we all have one of those games that we've heard great things about but just never had the time to get into. For me personally, this would be the Yakuza series of video games. I've been somewhat familiar with the franchise for a while now, thanks to word of mouth and some footage of the games I've seen online, but I haven't had the time to really sink my teeth into any of these titles. That all changed however when I included Yakuza 0 in a poll I made to decide which game I'd cover next on the channel. To my surprise, the game ended up winning by a large margin. I've been wanting to try out these games for a while now and have been looking for an excuse to do so. But before I get right into it, there's a few things I need to say. People were wondering why I wanted to start off with Yakuza 0 instead of Yakuza Kiwami, which is a remake of the first game. This is for a few reasons. Yakuza 0 came out in Japan in 2015, with Kiwami being released the following year. While Kiwami's plot is faithful to the PS2 original, there were extra scenes added that tie the game closer to Zero. There's also the fact that the main combat mechanics in Kiwami are taken straight from Zero instead of the original Yakuza. For me personally, it only makes sense to start with the game that the remake attempts to tie into. A part of me feels obligated to play the PS2 Yakuza before I play Kiwami, so I can have a better understanding of what was changed. Depending on how things turn out, I might even look at both titles in a future video. There's also the fact that Yakuza 0 is a prequel set before the events of the first game, meaning that it's the perfect jumping off point. While I have no doubt that I'd get more out of the narrative if I played the other games, it isn't mandatory to understand what's going on. Just like always, there are going to be major spoilers throughout this video. Yakuza 0 is a plot heavy game and in order to give my full thoughts, I'm going to have to discuss the major events. If you haven't played Yakuza 0, then I suggest you do so before watching this video. This story has a lot of of twists and turns and I don't want to be the one to ruin the surprises. I also want to give a special shout out to a longtime viewer and channel supporter Darth Reggie. He ended up gifting me a copy of this game on Steam when he heard I was going to be covering this game on the channel. I very much appreciate you for doing that man, and I hope I end up doing the game justice. With that out of the way, let's see what the criminal underbelly has in store for us. Our story begins in December of 1988 in the fictitious city of Kamurocho, home of the Dojima family, one of the largest subsidiaries of the Tojo clan. Kazuma Kiryu, a somewhat new and low-ranking member of the Dojima family, is tasked with collecting someone's debt for a loan shark. Things take a sharp turn, however, when the man is later found dead with a bullet in his head. Since Kiryu assaulted the man prior to his death, he's the prime suspect in this murder case, and is advised to turn himself into the police in order to keep them from looking into the family's operations. However, this would result in the expulsion of Kiryu's adoptive father, Shintaro Kazuma, from the Dojima family, since he was the one who brought Kiryu in. While Kiryu pleads his innocence in this situation, the Dojima family lieutenants are firm in their stance that he should take the fall for the murder. However, things aren't as simple as they first seem. We learn that the Dojima family has been buying up pieces of land for the revitalization project, but haven't been able to acquire the spot known as the Empty Lot. This place just so happens to hold the power to completely shut down the project, and no one knows who the owner is. The Dojima family is willing to do anything in their power to secure the plot of land, and the patriarch of the family is offering Kazuma's position of captain to the lieutenant that gets the job done. One of the lieutenants, Daisaku Kuze, wants Kiryu to go to prison because he believes that Kazuma has a clue as to who currently owns the empty lot, and believes that he'd be willing to give this information to Kiryu. This causes the young man to believe that Kuze was the one who set him up for the murder. Since Kuze outranks Kiryu, there's no way he can go against his orders without facing consequences. The only way to ensure Kazuma's safety safety in this situation is for Kiryu to get himself excommunicated from the Yakuza so he can continue his murder investigation as a civilian. Not too long after leaving the Dojima family, Kiryu is approached by Tatsu Tachibana, the president of Tachibana Real Estate. While at first, Tachibana seems very suspicious as he knows a little too much about Kiryu's personal life. It's eventually revealed that he's actually working alongside Kazuma. The two have teamed up since Kazuma fears that if the Dojima family acquires the empty lot, their influence within the Tojo clan will become too strong, which could result in an all-out war within the clan. After learning Tachibana's intentions, Kiryu decides to join his real estate company to not only acquire the empty lot, but to also clear his own name, even if that means they'll have to go up against the Dojima family. However, this is only one half of the story. At the start of Chapter 3, we're introduced to the secondary protagonist. Goro Majima is the manager of Sotenbori's most popular cabaret club. He's an ex-member of the Yakuza who, after failing to obey orders, was erased from the Tojo clan. After surviving a year of torture and losing his left eye, Majima spends his days trapped in Sotenbori, under the constant watch of Tsukasa Sagawa, who promises to let Majima back into the Tojo clan once he pays off his debts. 
Majima is desperate to go back to his Yakuza life, and Sagawa takes advantage of that. He hires Majima to perform a hit on someone named Makoto Makimura, a pimp who's been operating on Sagawa's territory without paying. While Majima is initially against the offer, he ends up accepting it in order to escape his situation. However, things turn out to be more complicated than Majima first thought when he heads to Makoto's side job to confront them. During his fight with who he thought was Makoto, members of the Yakuza break into the clinic also looking for Makoto. It's revealed that the man Majima's been fighting is actually a former Chinese gangster named Wen Hai Li, and his blind assistant is the real Makoto Makamura. Things obviously aren't adding up here. Makoto is a totally different person than the way Sagawa described her as. What exactly did she do that's getting her involved with the Yakuza? Majima decides to abandon his mission and protect Makoto so he can hopefully find the answers he seeks. That's the general gist behind Yakuza Zero's narrative. The story is split into 17 chapters, 8 for Kiryu and 8 for Majima, with the final chapter acting as the conclusion for both characters' journeys. While for the most part, these stories are disconnected, but they do eventually tie into each other near the end of the game. However, this is done in a way that doesn't distract from what each story focuses on. Without giving too much away now, the overall story of Yakuza 0 is pretty straightforward. Both protagonists have their motivations established during their introductions, and the remainder of their stories are focused on the trials they need to go through and how their struggles shape them as people. As much as I want to dive into the minutia now, I want to cover the gameplay first. There's no better place to start than with the main combat mechanics. On the surface, the battles in this game can be seen as a tribute to classic 2D beat-em-ups. Whenever you're swarmed by enemies, it's your goal to knock their lights out in any way you choose. While your options may be somewhat limited at first, the game quickly opens up and gives you a lot of tools to play around with. You can beat your enemies into submission with punches and kicks, use the environment to your advantage by smashing their heads into fences, and even crush your foes with objects you can pick up. The main depth of the combat system lies in the heat gauge, as well as the multiple fighting styles you have access to. By attacking enemies and not getting hit, you slowly build up the heat gauge that's just below your health bar. With each level of heat, your attacks not only become faster, but you gain access to special abilities. These can range from some passive buffs, such as upgrading how many times you're able to evade, to more useful abilities, like allowing you to instantly counterattack upon getting hit. However, the most desirable ability you gain access to are heat actions. These are context-sensitive attacks that deal crazy amounts of damage, but come with the cost of lowering your heat gauge. This is such a great idea, as tempting as it would be to use your heat actions as soon as you're able to, it comes with the steep price of lowering your heat gauge back to level 1. This inherent risk reward design is a pretty good way to balance how powerful heat actions are. Sure, you can deal a devastating blow to a single enemy, possibly more depending on the heat action, but it comes with the price of temporarily making your character less effective until you build up heat again. In order to get the hang of the game's combat system, you need to learn when the best time to use heat actions are, and when you should just rely on your normal attacks. However, this is only half of the equation. Mastering the many different fighting styles is also a huge part of Yakuza 0's combat system. For a majority of the game, both protagonists will have access to three unique fighting styles, with a fourth hidden style being unlocked once you finish a certain side activity. Much like Devil May Cry, you can switch between your active fighting styles with the D-pad. For Kiryu, we have his standard Brawler style, which is a good bounce between speed and power, the Rush style, which sacrifices power and the ability to grab enemies in exchange for speed and extra dodges, and finally, the Beast style. It's the slowest of Kiryu's styles, but it packs one hell of a punch and allows you to automatically grab items in the environment. Majima's fighting styles, on the other hand, while following the basic formula of power and speed balance, do so in a very different way. Majima's thug style is very similar to Kiryu's brawler style on the surface, but comes with its own unique quirks to make it stand out. The breaker style, while the fastest, is more so focused on dealing with large groups and showing off some sweet dance moves. And the slugger style specializes in raw power and gives extra bonuses to equipable weapons. Each style has its own specific uses in combat, and it's up to the player to recognize when the best time to use a certain style is. In a room with a bunch of expensive furniture? Then it's time to break out the B style and just go to town. This is a great way to not only deal damage, but you'll also fill up the heat gauge in no time flat. Come across a guy with a gun? Once you have the right upgrade, just use Majima's thug style to disarm the enemy and take the gun for yourself. But remember, you're always at the mercy of the heat gauge, so you have to strategically pick when you want to bring out the big guns. I quite like the combat mechanics in Yakuza 0, however, I feel as though the game doesn't really do much to incentivize creative play in combat. To use Devil May Cry as an example, a lot of the real meat of the combat system is rooted in how the game ranks your performance. By keeping the combat flowing at a good pace and using a variety of moves, you can increase your style rank. 
While the rank itself doesn't have any immediate gameplay benefits aside from different taunt animations, your end stage rank will determine how much currency you earn to spend on upgrades. This creates a nice loop where you want to earn a high rank in combat so you can buy even more moves to play around with. Yakuza 0 does something somewhat similar, but it isn't nearly as effective. Money is given out at the end of combat encounters, and can be used to upgrade your styles. At the start of the game, this system works quite well, but once the upgrades become more expensive, money through combat is no longer viable. By the time this becomes a problem, you would have already unlocked the main side activities to earn money, but I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. The point I'm trying to make is that there's no longer a reason for you to experiment in combat outside of personal gratification. While the game does somewhat punish you for spamming the same heat actions, it isn't enough to stop people from just button mashing to victory. I've seen a lot of people say that Yakuza 0 doesn't have a deep combat system, but that couldn't be further from the truth. There's a lot for you to do in the combat if you're willing to break out of your comfort zone and experiment a little, but as I stated, there's no punishment for sticking to old tricks. This means that there's a section of the player base that probably only picked one style and stuck with it, and if they still enjoyed the combat system that way, then more power to them. For me personally, I try to squeeze as much juice out of a game's combat system as I can. My own incentive stems from the desire to really push what I could do with the mechanics presented to me, and to just craft really cool looking combos. I may as well also quickly address another issue I have with the game's combat design while we're on the topic. Consumable items in Yakuza 0 are pretty overpowered. Throughout story missions, or just by visiting drugstores, you can buy items that you can use to restore your HP and heat gauge. The problem with these items is that they're too cheap to buy, and you can use them in the middle of battle. There isn't much tension in the combat, because I know that if I'm on the ropes, I can just use one of these items without consequences. You can hold a lot of these items too, so if you just make sure to stock up at the start of every chapter, then you're golden. A simple fix for this would to either greatly limit how many of these items you can carry, or just only allow you to use them when you're outside of combat. However, despite the issues, I still have a good time with this combat system. The characters have a lot of weight to them, which makes their punches feel incredibly satisfying to land. When I finally learned how to properly balance my heat actions as to not leave myself vulnerable, that's when Yakuza 0's combat clicked for me. Sure, it's not as complex as something like Devil May Cry, but the more grounded nature of Yakuza 0's combat system gives it a sense of identity. The best uses of the combat, in my opinion, are in the linear beat-em-up missions. The reason as to why I like these so much is because the game just asks you to go to town on a bunch of unsuspecting punks. There are also plenty of opportunities to use the more situational, over-the-top heat actions here, such as this one where Majima catches a guy's sword in his mouth, kicks it out of his hand, and then throws it back at him. While the core combat of Yakuza 0 is a big part of the experience, we're not even scratching the surface as to the content the game has to offer. A huge part of the Yakuza series is the open world itself, and the many activities you can partake in. These work really well whenever you want to take a break from the main story and just have some fun. Whether that be spending time at the bar to sing some karaoke, head to the arcades to play some classic Sega games like OutRun or Space Harrier, hit the clubs to show off some sweet dance moves, partake in some underground gambling where you bet on cat fights that I swear are rigged, and many, many more. You're given access to plenty of minigames at the start of Chapter 2, with even more becoming available as you progress through the story. For side activities that are completely optional, there's a lot of polish to each minigame. Some of them, such as billiards and pocket RC card racing, have so much depth and options to choose from that they can easily be a big time sink for some people. While minigames are great and all, Yakuza Zero's open world features a plethora of side missions to take up your time. Sub-stories are very bite-sized missions that are primarily used to provide some comedic levity to help balance out the tone of the main plot. Off the top of my head, there's the band who you have to teach how to act like punks so they can keep up their image, the time where you have to pretend to be someone's boyfriend so their father stops pestering them about it, the time Kiryu has to pretend to be a movie producer and assist with a production, and some even more out there stories such as showing a dominatrix how to do her job better, and even assisting Michael Jackson with the filming of a music video. Even though most sub-stories are played for laughs, I can't help but feel as though there could have been much more done with the concept. Almost every sub-story is self-contained, and I think that this is greatly limiting. This current format only works with one-off stories, which, while the intention of the concept, I would have liked to have seen what a potential ongoing narrative would look like. We do get hints of that with the guy who's in charge of the RC car races, but I would have liked to have seen more of this from other side characters. I do like the sub-stories as they are now, but I think they could have been a bit more ambitious. They're harmless at worst, but the true use of sub-stories is actually in the way that it ties into Kiryu's and Majima's side hustles. 
Somewhat early on in the adventure, you're introduced to the character's specific side activities to help you earn some quick cash. For Kiryu, this would be his real estate operation where his goal is to become the most wealthy man in Kamurocho. And for Majima, he gets his rundown cabaret club where he's supposed to turn it into Sotenbori's hottest attraction. Let's start with Kiryu's first. The mechanics behind the real estate management are actually quite simple. When you're at your base of operations, you can start collecting money from the properties you own. Before you do so, however, you need to assign that district with a manager and some security. Each manager is accompanied with a stat chart. The numbers here represent how much money they can collect while you employ them, with the positive and negative integers representing how much money they'll make on the current shift. The same basic idea holds true for security as well, but instead of earning you money, you're buying yourself some protection. You see, by partaking in real estate, you're tampering on the business of some shady individuals known as the Kings of Kamarocho, and they're going to do everything in their power to put a stop to your business. If your current security rank is low, then the kings will send thugs to disrupt your business, putting a temporary stop to your earnings in that district until you take care of the problem. This is why having good security is necessary, as it lowers the odds of this happening. However, you're not going to be making money by just sticking to a single piece of property. While running around the many districts of Kamarocho, you'll come across buildings that you can buy as an investment. You can then upgrade these new pieces of land by paying advisors. Each advisor specializes in specific property types, but some of the better advisors will cost you a pretty penny to higher. Not only does this increase how much money you'll earn when collecting a payout, but also increases how much of the current district you own. Once you reach the ownership of 90%, the king of the district will challenge you to a fight, beat their ass into the ground, and the district is yours to own, meaning that you'll no longer have to hire security in that area. This is the main goal of Kiryu's real estate. You need to take down the five kings in order to challenge the mastermind behind this whole operation. Take him out and you'll unlock the fourth hidden fighting style for Kiryu. This style can be best described as a jack of all trades, since it takes aspects from the three other fighting styles while also having its own unique quirks. When it comes to the real estate side activity, that's basically all you need to know. It's pretty simple on paper, but that's what I like about it. It's a project that you work on while doing other things in the open world, and you even get a pretty good reward for completing it. I'm a little ashamed to admit it, but for a while, this basically became the game for me. There was just something I found so addicting in earning a massive payout, so I would end up just taking my money and reinvesting it into real estate. While waiting for my profits to collect, I'd hit the batting cages, go bowling, race my shitty RC car around, anything to kill time before using my earnings to upgrade not only my combat abilities, but to also reinvest in real estate. I spent an embarrassingly long time on this activity alone, but it really just goes to show how good of a progression loop Yakuza 0 has. Another thing I really liked about the real estate activity is that sub-stories now have a purpose outside of giving you a laugh. By completing sub-stories, you can possibly recruit new members to join your team. For example, once you finish the sub-stories relating to Miracle Johnson, you unlock him as an advisor for real estate. This is a great way to entice players to experience all the content the game has to offer, as every piece of it leads back to the progression loop. However, this is only half of the equation. Majima's side activity, while following the basic goal of taking down the current bosses of each district, does it in an entirely different way. In the open world, you can recruit girls to join your cabaret club by either giving them a gift or completing a sub-story. Each girl is equipped with their own stats and areas they specialize in, and your goal for each shift is to find out which girl is the most compatible with each customer. Every once in a while, you'll be called over to assist one of the girls and you'll need to correctly lead their hand signals so you can respond accordingly. Answer correctly, and you'll receive some bonuses such as improving a guest's mood or having the girl recover some stamina. Your goal with each shift is to try to please as many guests as possible so you can not only earn a lot of money, but so you'll also improve the the club's reputation and gain more fans as a result. Those are the absolute basics of the Cabaret Club because trust me, this minigame is far more complex than you may first realize. There's a surprising amount of skill and strategy needed in order to maximize profits and efficiency. You'll need to consider the moods of the girls you're about to put on shift, how much money a customer is carrying on them so you can decide if it's worth potentially giving them a lower quality girl, strategically swapping girls around with customers in order to keep everyone happy, and when the best time to activate your special fever pitch move is in order to squeeze every penny out of your customers. It can honestly be pretty overwhelming at first, but with enough practice you'll get the hang of it. Another thing you have to consider is the ranking of your girls. Your girls can be ranked from bronze all the way to platinum. In order to keep things simple, let's just focus on platinum girls since they're easily the most versatile ones you have access to. A special perk of platinum girls is that before every shift, you can do special training with a girl in order to quickly increase some of their stats. You'll mostly be participating in these one-on-one -on -one conversations where you have to choose the best answer in order 
order to max out the bar at the top of the screen. The girl will gain experience depending on how much you manage to fill up the bar before the end of the training. Another advantage Platinum Girls have over the others is that you're able to customize their clothing. This actually holds some gameplay benefits since their outfits determine their appeal. This easily makes Platinum Girls some of the most versatile ones to have on a shift. Once you earn enough bands in a district, the competing club will challenge you to a competition to see who can make the most amount of money in a single shift. If you manage to win, you'll earn another Platinum Girl as well as a huge cash bonus. It's easy to see that Majima's Cabaret Club is a far more fledged out activity than Kiryu's real estate. While I do think that it's the better mini game between the two, I can't help but feel as though the real estate management worked better in the context of it being a side activity. Since real estate management was pretty hands off for the most part, it lends itself well as something to multitask with. As I said earlier, the real estate fits so well into the game's progression loop since your income is generated automatically, so you can do whatever you want while waiting. While it's impossible to deny that the Cabaret Club is a better, more fleshed out minigame, it doesn't fit into that loop that I enjoyed. Strangely enough, for a minigame that requires more skill in managing, you don't earn nearly the amount of money as the real estate activity, at least from what I experienced. I personally didn't find it necessary to fully complete the Cabaret Club side quest for this video, but I did get over halfway through it. I didn't stop because I wasn't having any fun with the activity, but it just didn't have the same click as the real estate management did. Just like Kiryu, you unlock a fourth fighting style upon finishing the quest, so maybe I'll go back one day just so I can try it out for myself. That's all there is to talk about regarding the major gameplay facets of Yakuza 0. There's a lot of content here, and a good majority of it is pretty polished. Sure, there are a few blemishes here and there, and the sub-stories could have used more unique ongoing plots to mix things up now and again, but those few low points don't drag down the overall gameplay experience. However, I think I need to clarify that I didn't 100% complete this game for the sake of this video. Yakuza 0 is a very large game, and you'll definitely be getting your money's worth for how much varied content there is for you to experience. By the end of my playthrough, I put about 64 hours into the game and I still have a lot of activities I need to fully explore. I didn't stop out of a lack of interest, but I did decide that I had my fill and just wanted to spend the rest of my playthrough playtime experiencing the story at around the 40 hour mark. Speaking of which, I do believe it's time we wrap this up and cover the rest of the main plot. One of the many things I heard about Yakuza 0 before playing this game for myself was that it had a very well written and compelling narrative. For the most part, I agree with this statement. However, there are a few things I take issue with that sadly hold back the overall story that's trying to be told here. I still think it's good, don't get me wrong, but I don't fully agree with the praise the story gets. As I said at the start of the video, the main plot is told to us through the alternating perspectives of Kiryu and Majima. While at first it may seem as though their stories are irrelevant to each other, they slowly begin to intertwine as the game progresses. However, the main core of these character stories are still separate, so for the sake of keeping things concise, I'll be judging them separately. Before we get started, I do have a piece of criticism that applies to both sides of the story. As I mentioned earlier in the video, you change protagonists every two chapters. And while that's perfectly fine on paper, in execution, this leads to a lot of pacing issues. What ends up happening is that right when you start getting invested in one story, the game suddenly rips it away from you to focus on something else entirely. And since there's so much content for you to do in the game, it could potentially be hours before the game continues that plot thread. It feels very abrupt, and leads to tonal whiplash. A perfect example of this is at the end of chapter 4. Majima just spent the last half of the chapter defending Makoto from Yakuza members that are trying to kill her. Just when we think that the coast is clear, Majima begins to contemplate murdering her while she has this sense of security. The game cuts to black just before we get to see his decision, and instead of immediately showing us what comes next, we're thrusted back to Kiryu's story where he has to learn the basics of real estate management. As a first time player experiencing this, I can't even begin to describe described just how much this pulled me out of the story, and this isn't the only time that this happens. Granted, I find that the perspective changes work better when the characters become more intertwined. When it's used to give us answers to questions raised for one character, then I think it's used well, but at the start of the game, when we're establishing character motives in the world, then I take issue. With that out of the way, let's talk about Kiryu's story first. As I said earlier, the story focuses on Kiryu's journey to help Tachibana real estate claim the empty lot, in order to ensure the safety of his adopted adoptive father, Kazuma. What most of the actual plot amounts to is the journey in order to reach that goal, and the obstacles that Kiryu must overcome. He's willing to go up against the entire Dojima family, including the lieutenants, because he's firm in his resolve. However, other than that, I struggle to really connect with Kiryu as a protagonist. This all comes down to the fact that I think his main motivation isn't explored as much as it could have been. 
happen. Very early on, it's established that Kiryu feels as though he's in debt to Kazuma because he raised him while staying at the Sunflower Orphanage. This is one of the main reasons as to why Kiryu joined the Yakuza in the first place. That, and Kiryu also desired the same status and respect that Kazuma has. While this is a decent place to start with Kiryu's character, the game doesn't really take full advantage of this for any personal growth. There are many times in the story where Kiryu's loyalty to Kazuma is called into question, but instead of giving us scenes with Kiryu questioning his relationship with his adoptive dad, we instead are just reminded that Kiryu is willing to give his life for the man, no matter what. It leaves me with many unanswered questions. What does Kiryu really think of Kazuma as a person? Does Kazuma really care about Kiryu, or is he just an asset to him? I only have these thoughts because Kiryu goes through so much trouble and hardships in order to keep this man safe, so I would have liked more clarification on their relationship. Besides this, I do enjoy this character in the context of this being an action movie type of story. He is your typical underdog protagonist that has to fight against forces bigger than himself. It's satisfying to see him overcome those obstacles and push himself past his limits. That's not to say that I think Kiryu is a bad character, I do quite enjoy his personality, especially in the sub-stories. While he's usually portrayed as a very stern and noble person, he's not afraid to cut loose every now and again and have some fun. I just feel like in this game, the writers didn't want to have Kiryu change too much so that it would conflict with the first Yakuza. So as a result, they played it very safe with his character. While Kiryu may falter a bit in the main story, I think the characters around him more than make up for it. I'm primarily referring to Kiryu's oath brother Nishikiyama and Tetsu Tachibana, the owner of the real estate business. These two end up being the emotional core of Kiryu's side of the story. More so Tachibana than Nishiki, since the former is a much larger part of the game's overall narrative. Nishiki is a pretty cool character though. He grew up with Kiryu in the same orphanage, and the two joined the Yakuza at the same time. Since the two are Oath Brothers, Nishiki is willing to do anything for Kiryu's sake. It's a very similar relationship described to us between Kiryu and Kazuma, but it's more believable since there's a lot more screen time between these two characters. One of my favorite scenes involving these two characters has to be at the end of Chapter 6. At this point in the story, Kiryu is being hunted down by all of the Dojima family, and Nishiki helps him escape the city. However, he does this with the purpose of mercy killing Kiryu. He can't stand the idea of Kiryu being captured and tortured by the Dojima family, and since he sees no other way out of this situation, he wants to make sure his oath brother goes out in the quickest, most painless way possible. The thing is, Nishiki can't bring himself to cross that line and kill a man, especially if it's Kiryu. This eventually leads into Nishiki throwing away his role as a Dojima family member so he can join up with Kiryu and help him on his journey. The relationship between these two characters was one of my favorite parts of this story, because of just how good the chemistry between these two characters are. While he isn't in the game for that long, he does leave a good impact on me. Tachibana is also a pretty well executed character. He starts off as someone who's shrouded in mystery, and seems to only care about his own agenda. This all ends up changing over the course of the game when he begins to bond with Kiryu, and we learn about his depressing past. It turns out that Tachibana grew up in China with his mother and sister, but was constantly shamed and prosecuted for being Japanese. Tachibana would eventually flee his home and move to Japan, where he eventually found wealth through the life of a gangster. He would eventually feel regret for leaving them behind, and upon hearing that they've also moved to Japan, he decided to seek them out. Tachibana learns that his sister was actually the owner of the empty lot, and inherited it after their grandfather died. So Tachibana made it his mission to do anything in his power to secure the lot in order to guarantee the safety of his own sister. What makes Tachibana a compelling character for me is his selflessness. He suffers through a lot of hardships throughout the story, both physically and mentally, in order to forgive himself for abandoning his family. His story is a relatively straightforward one, but it works in the context of the rest of the narrative. It's one of the main driving forces of the plot, and it's used as a connecting thread for Kiryu's and Majima's story. Kiryu's side of the narrative does give us a lot of important information regarding the overall plot of Yakuza 0, but I think it's the weaker of the two stories. This mostly boils boils down to Kiryu as a protagonist. As I said earlier, I like the character just fine, but I just don't think enough was done with him to really make it have a lot of lasting impact. I did enjoy the journey with him regardless of that. It was an entertaining ride that had a lot of hype moments, and some genuinely emotional ones that really made me feel for these characters. Now on to the Mad Dog himself. As I mentioned earlier, Majima's story revolves around his relationship with Makoto Makimura, as well as giving him a new outlook on life. Between him and Kiryu, I think that Majima works way better as a protagonist. He's an ex-Yakuza member that desperately wants back into the clan. It's the only way of living that he knows, and he's willing to do almost anything to get back to that life. But even for Majima, there's lines that he doesn't want to cross. He's now torn between two worlds. Either he kills Makoto and gets back 
into the Yakuza. Or he can try to hide her away and stay trapped in a life where the very city he lives in is a prison. This basic idea behind Majima's story may seem very simple on paper, but it's the execution of this concept that's done masterfully. Majima's relationship with Makoto is one of the core aspects to his story. There's a lot of time spent having Majima and Makoto bond and even relate to each other. It's revealed that Makoto used to be sold as a slave and was forced to endure hell for years. These traumatic events are the root cause of her blindness, and Majima is able to sympathize with her. The relationship is put to the test near the end of the game. It's revealed that the reason why everyone's after her is because she's the current owner of the empty lot, and the younger sister of Tachibana. After witnessing her older brother's death, Makoto desperately wants to get revenge on the Dojima family's lieutenants as they were the ones responsible. Even though Majima tries to discourage her, Makoto ends up wanting to use her position as the empty lot owner to try to make that happen. However, she ends up being hostile lies after she's shot by an assassin hired by the Dojima family. After Makoto enters critical condition, Majima decides to enact her final request, and tears through the Dojima family HQ. One of the reasons as to why this works so well is because of how much time was spent developing the relationship between these two. While he doesn't end up going through with the murder, it just goes to show how much Majima cared about Makoto. But the secondary reason as to why this works is because of what the other half of Majima's story focuses on. Majima's always being led around on a leash by his boss Sagawa, and as we we see throughout the game, Sagawa doesn't seem to be a man of his word. All hope seems lost for Majima, that is until he comes across a man named Nishitani. Through the few interactions that Majima has with Nishitani, he's able to see that the man has his own set of values, and acts unchained and living as a free spirit. While Majima first assumes he's a lunatic, his worldview is shifted when Nishitani ends up sacrificing his own life for him. While he did die an early death, he went out in his own way, living in the way he wanted to. This sticks with Majima and he begins to desire a life like this for himself. By the end of the game, he's treated as a pawn by the people around him and has been manipulated solely for someone else's benefit. So Majima deciding on his own terms to go up against the Dojima family is him metaphorically breaking out of his cage. I think that it's pretty obvious that I vastly prefer Majima's story to Kiryu's. This all comes down to the fact that Majima, as a protagonist, is way more compelling and goes through a lot more changes. His entire the entire story is based on the idea of a man taking back control of his life and living in the way that he wants to. Obviously, I can't fully appreciate his origin because I haven't experienced what the character is like in the other stories, but if this is just the start for Majima, then I'm excited to see how far he's willing to take this philosophy. And that's the end of Yakuza 0. Overall, I think that I had a pretty great time, even with some of the trappings. The main combat is solid, with quite a few mechanics to play around with if you're willing to experiment. There's plenty of content to experience in the open world, whether that be the mini-games, side activities, or the sub-stories, even if I don't think they reach their fullest potential. When it comes to the overall plot of Yakuza 0, I really enjoyed it. Even though I found Kiryu to be a bit weaker than Majima, there's still a lot for me to enjoy. The performances were great, there were a lot of exciting moments, and a majority of the characters were fleshed out. However, I can't deny that the pacing issues can be a major problem for some people. I know for myself, it took a while to really get engaged in the main plot with just how slow things were moving at the start, but if you do decide to stick with it, things do eventually become much more engaging. So the question comes down to how much time you're willing to give a game a chance until you decide to put it down. If you're not interested in slower paced narratives, then I'm not sure that this game will be for you. The narrative is a huge part of Yakuza Zero's experience, so if you're unable to get into it, then you might be better off elsewhere. While it may have taken me a bit to finally get around to playing this game, I don't regret the decision at all, but I will admit that I've had my fill for the next while. I'm not entirely sure when I'll get around to trying out the other games in this series, but it's something I do plan to do at some point. Depending on how things turn out, this might not be the last time we visit Kamarocho on this channel. Hey everyone, thanks for watching! I'd like to give a special shout out to all of my channel supporters whose names are on screen now. If you'd like to support the channel, you can do so through Patreon or through channel memberships. I have a few things I can offer in return, such as early video access and a special Discord role. This video ended up taking a bit longer to make than I wanted it to, but that's mostly because Yakuza 0 was a much bigger game than I expected it to be. Hopefully the next video won't take as long to finish. Speaking of which,
such, the next video is going to be on the highly requested Shin Megami Tensei 4. It's been a while since my last mainline video, and since SMT5 is coming out in November, there's no better time than now to go back to the series. I had a lot of fun letting viewers decide what I should cover on the channel, so I might end up doing it again in order to keep things fresh around here. As much as I love to talk about Mega 10 games, the last thing I want is for the channel to become predictable or stale. And I personally think that this is the most interesting way to do so. If you want to stay up to date with the channel, then please follow my Twitter at Nams Compendium or join my Discord server. Both links will be in the description below. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you all next time.